So, hello friends, I am continuing the overview on this uh, very important topic uh, with a little focus on the recent updates uh, currently and uh, the key variables that every intensivist should know about it. Uh, so, right now as I am speaking, we have a patient in ICU uh, with this condition which can be life-threatening and it is imperative that every intensivist uh, knows about this particular condition and nitty that revolve around this condition. So I wish to acknowledge uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Ritu, who helped me develop this content. Uh, so I'll just start with this uh, case. So this is a 23-year-old male uh, who has who was referred from another hospital. Uh, so he had this polytrauma with bilateral acetabular fracture with right shaft of femur. Uh, so this gentleman was in the ward awaiting for fracture fixation the next day when he developed short of breath and obtentation. Uh, so obviously the MRI was done and uh, chest x-rays were done. We showed these sort of features. So where there was multiple micro infarcts, uh, as you can see. Uh, and uh, along with this, there was this fracture. And this is a chest x-ray which showed uh, alveolar-based opacities at the ground glassing. Uh, so, all this uh, suggestive of uh, possible fat embolism given the clinical context. So, we just look into uh, the way we go about dealing with this. So, as I'm speaking, this patient is on uh, ventilator. Uh, so, his are all his vitals are good, uh, needing minimal oxygen, but neurologically, he's fairly spaced out. Uh, so, he moves his limbs, but uh, non purposive eye movements. So, we are awaiting till Wednesday if he doesn't do really good, we may do trachea or we may give a trial of extubation if he at least starts comprehending. So that's his clinical situation. So what is fat embolism? So as the name sounds, whenever an individual or someone has a long bone fracture or any cosmetic surgeries, so the fat gets dislodged from the bone marrow and enters the systemic circulation. And when we say fat embolism syndrome, friends, uh, it predominantly manifests with three systemic presentations. One is the skin. So they can have particular rashes. The second one is they can go into respiratory distress. And the third is neurological manifestation, which, which all of which this patient had. Uh, so he did have a, a particular rash also on the trunk. Uh, so these are the typical triad of uh, fat embolism. So when you look at incidence, uh, it's fairly low, 0.5 to 2% of the long bone fractures tend to have uh, fat embolism. And 10, if someone has had multiple bone fracture, variable degree of fat embolism can happen in 10%. And typical onset is 12 to 72 hours after polytrauma. That's what this patient precisely had. He had a trauma around 48 hours back, awaiting in the ward for a surgery next day, and he, under <coughs> he developed fat embolism. <coughs> or 12 to 72 hours post-surgically. And when you look at the spectrum, there's a lot of fat embolism possibly may go unrecognized when they present as subclinical or it can manifest with clinical <clears throat> or it can uh, present with the typical <clears throat> presentation that we had with a fulminant ERDS. So this is the sort of a spectrum of presentation of fat embolism. So and be very friends that this is a life-threatening condition and mortality in the literature is referenced at 5 to 15%. And uh, someone can have higher mortality based on the severity of neurological involvement and lung involvement. And most mortality have been reported where the lungs have been more severely affected. So this is the epidemiological data that we have about fat embolism. And there are, apart from the trauma, there are distinct other population who are at a risk for fat embolism. So of course, one is the trauma per se. And fat embolism can occur during the fixation and the reaming of the fracture bone. Uh, so during that phase, fat embolism can occur. And someone who has a sickle trait, they are at a higher risk of, of developing fat embolism. So another interesting area in a surgical scenario where fat embolism can happen is in a large volume liposuction. So the, but I'm sure many of you uh, may have read in reports that someone who's underwent surgery for a obesity, they suddenly did uh, have a cardiac arrest and, and, and we do come across such reports uh, possibly attributed to the fat embolism. So, and this is a very clear uh, sort of a clinical situation where there is a risk of fat embolism, especially when someone is undergoing large volume 
uh, liposuction procedure. And someone with the bone marrow disorders can be at a risk. And uh, dictionary's muscle dystrophy have been particularly found to be at a higher risk because of the poor bone health. So these are other conditions which you just need to keep in the back of mind as the population who are at a risk for fat embolism syndrome. So when you look at the pathophysiology of uh, fat embolism, as the name sounds, the fat enters the systemic circulation and it can lead to microembolization within the brain, which leads to all these microinfarcts. So there is a biochemical therapy, uh, biochemical theory, sorry, where there is free fatty acid circulation, which is touted as one of the things. And there is platelet aggregation that tends to happen. And there is a sort of a biochemical sort of a pneumonitis that tends to happen mediated by interleukin 1 beta. So basically, once the fat enters the systemic circulation, there is some sort of an inflammatory cascade that gets activated. There is... Uh, there is leukotrienes and cytokines that get released, which leads to lung injury, platelet aggregation, and they can have uh, organ dysfunction secondary to this, along with the free fatty acids. So this is the biochemical theory and the cellular theory. And when you look at uh, the newer evidence that is evolved, so they have identified certain markers uh, which determine population at a risk for developing fat embolism. NL NLRP3 inflammasome is looked at as a biochemical marker or a biomarker which uh, identifies the patients at risk for developing fat embolism or patients who have fat embolism. So NLRP3, this is a newer sort of a uh, scientific basis for this. And interleukin 1 beta has been identified in fat embolism which predominantly causes this ARDS and lung injury or pneumonitis in these patients. And <clears throat> There is this uh, MAPK cascade which gets activated, which is mitogen activated protein kinase, sort of a signaling pathway. So these are signaling pathways. So mitogen activated protein kinase and ERK uh, signaling pathways tends to get activated in fat embolism. Along with this, there is this peroxidation cascade, fatty peroxidation uh, cascade also which gets activated. So these are some of the uh, so, so some of the basic science research that is looking at the key mediators uh, which causes organ dysfunction in fat embolism. So you can remember NLRP3 because there is scientific work happening on looking at this as a biomarker, interleukin 1 beta causing lung injury and there are certain signaling pathways like MAPK and ERK signaling pathway and fatty acid peroxidation cascade. So just for all the uh, clever ones, if you want to remember, this is the sort of a newer sort of a scientific basis for uh, damage that happens in fat embolism. So when you look at diagnostic approach, friends, and this is what, uh, and, and I believe this fat embolism has been asked in BRNB exam. So at least you need to mention what are the key criteria. There are two criteria. So one is Goods criteria and Sean Field criteria. And it is very simple. So the Goods criteria pretty much encompasses all the clinical uh, conundrum that tends to happen in fat embolism like neurological involvement, skin involvement, respiratory involvement and, and, and uh, the hematological involvement where there are certain cytopenias that tend to happen. So obtentation tends to happen because of microinfarcts in the brain and they can have subconjunctival hemorrhage, they could have fever more than 38.5, they would have tachycardia, hypoxemia occurs due to lung involvement with PO2 less than 60. And there are skin rashes that are typically seen on the trunk or sometimes in the extremities. And one could identify fat globules as a diagnostic means. We can look for fat globules in the urine. And when you look at labs, they have anemia, thrombocytopenia because of the coagulation cascade that gets activated. And so they could have hypocholesterolemia. And uh, bronchalveolar lavage can show... Uh, uh, so the macrophages with uh, fat globules. So that is something that could be diagnostic in uh, confirming the diagnosis of fat. So urine fat globules is something we could send to the lab to identify and BAL to look for uh, fat in the macrophages, in the macrophage uh, inf infected with fat. And the emerging biomarkers that, uh, that has been looked into is NLRP3 inflammasome, which I spoke as one of the inflammatory media in fat embolism and interleukin 1 beta. So this is the GOODS criteria. And, uh, and one could look into the retina. They could see this cotton wool exudates uh, 
and fatty infiltrates, which is called Putscher's retinopathy. So for all the clever ones who want to remember all this, you could remember. So basically the key aspect is neurological involvement, respiratory, skin involvement, and labs mainly look at cytopenia, thrombocytopenia, anemia. If you are clever enough, you can remember NLRP3 as a biomarker interleukin 1 beta, and you can look at retina for Putscher's retinopathy. So these are the, some of the criteria. Then Schoenfeld criteria puts more emphasis so, uh, Sean Field, if there is more than five, you could call it as fat embolism. So, puts more emphasis on fatigue. It gives five points and x-ray changes gets four points. Hypoxemia gets three points and other things like tachycardia, tachypnea. So, easy to remember. So, more than five, you could call it as fat embolism syndrome. And what about imaging? So, typically, you do a chest x-ray. So, this is an MCQ question. I'm sure many of you would have read. It, it has a snowstorm appearance or a blizzard-like ground glass opacities, but typically like ERDS, they have alveolar infiltrates and they can manifest as ERDS. And very important, when this happens, one has to do an echocardiogram. We did an echocardiogram for our patient to look for, to look for whether they have AST or patent foramen oven, so which was absent. So you have to, one has to look for echocardiographic presence of uh, patent foramen oval or atrial septal defect look for RV strain and MRI when you do especially with the neurological obtentation they show this uh, sort of micro infarct which is called a star field micro infarct and along with this they can have uh, punctate micro hemorrhages as well <clears throat> so so the chest x-ray showing features of ERDS MRI showing features of star studded sort of a micro infarcts and punctate micro hemorrhage are typical of fat embolism. So what about prevention? What is the evidence-based strategies? So when someone has had a polytrauma with long bone, it is fairly intuitive for us all to uh, sort of uh, bear in mind that early fixation of the fractures is the key to prevent fat embolism. So early fixation within 24 hours goes a long way in preventing fat embolism. And during surgery, taking measures to reduce the pressurization and reducing the manipulation and careful dreaming. So these are some things which orthopods uh, possibly would bear in mind when they're fixing these fractures to prevent fat embolism. And from intensivist point of uh, view, so adequate hydration and preventing hypotension becomes a key in preventing fat embolism. When someone is undergoing cosmetic surgery, limiting the volume of fat that is extracted per session uh, goes a long way in preventing fat embolism and careful cannulation for drainage of this fat and avoiding increased negative pressure or some of the uh, uh, some some of the uh, uh, aspects that uh, a surgeon could keep in mind to prevent fat embolism so when it comes to treatment friends of fat embolism largely it remains supportive so maintenance of airway and uh, ventilation and someone who is like our patient intubated ventilated uh, applying the principles of lung protective ventilation and adequate hydration. Normovolemia is the key. So they should not be dehydrated. Dehydration versus the fat embolism. Obviously, when since they are in ARDS, you would want to avoid hypervolemia as well. So there is uh, some buzz whether heparin has a role. In fact, the evidence suggests heparin causes more harm. So the use of heparin as a therapeutic agent in fat embolism has to be avoided. So one should not use heparin because there was this discussion even in our uh, team as to whether there is a role of heparin. So you can use prophylactic low molecular weight heparin as you would use for any ICU patient. But therapeutic heparin has no role in uh, fat embolism. Steroids. So this is something we looked into literature whether this has a role. So the evidence is very sketchy. Uh, so there is no robust evidence to claim or say that steroids have a definitive role. But if you look into up to date, it suggests that you could use methylprednisolone one milligram per kg as a short term or hydrocortisone 100 mg 8th hourly. So the suggestion is you could use methylprednisolone 1 to 1 1.5 mg per day and hydrocortisone 100 mg 8th hourly for a short time. Basically, the role of steroids is to mitigate and reduce that inflammatory cascade that tends to happen because when the fat enters, it's like amniotic fluid embolism, it activates all the inflammatory cascades and there can be low-grade cytokine storm and the role of steroids is to mitigate that sort of a response is what you could bear in mind that the evidence predominantly comes from case series and case reports. And in severe uh, hypoxemia or ERDS or severe hypoxemia, 
So there are case reports of ECMO uh, having been used as a rescue therapy when hypoxemia is severe and not improving with your conventional ventilation. So with regards to steroids, friends, so if you dig into the literature, how much ever you did, it predominantly it comes from case series and case report. This is one meta-analysis you could look at where steroids have been used to reduce the risk of fat embolism, uh, especially in someone with long prone fracture, a short course of steroid uh, has had a benefit in reducing the risk for fat embolism. So this came from uh, the US group, actually it came from in the Canadian journal. So they looked into seven studies with 389 patients and they found the steroids reduced the risk of fat embolism by 78%, which is a quite, a, quite staggering sort of a figure and number needed to treat was eight. And steroids did reduce the risk of hypoxemia. Uh, with regards to mortality and infection, there was no difference with the use of steroids. And this is the forest plot uh, basically showing that uh, steroids had a significant role in reducing the risk of FES in patients with long bone fractures and uh, significantly reduced the risk of hypoxemia. So that's about it, friends, in fat embolism. So basically, understand the population who are at a risk, the key manifestations are neurological, respiratory, and skin, along with the lab. When you talk about the lab, it's predominantly anemia, thrombocytopenia, and some inflammatory uh, mediators like NL NLRP3 uh, as a biomarker interleukin-1 beta, which is the cause for the lung injury. There are certain populations uh, who are at a risk, especially the, the patients with the long bone fractures or a polytrauma and someone who's undergoing liposuction, bear in mind. And the diagnosis is Goods criteria and Schoenfield's criteria, which is very simple to remember. Treatment predominantly supportive and, and mortality uh, in severe cases can be up to 10% is what you need to remember. And steroids have some role. So we use steroids uh, for a short term. Uh, we use hydrocortisone in our patients. He's gotten better, so possibly he may have a short-term tracheostomy. And once his neurological status improves, we may decannulate him. And by Wednesday, if he improves, we may extubate him as well. So that's about it, friends. So thank you very much. Request you all to submit your valuable work to General of Acute Care. Of course, you can visit my website to read that research. Thank you. Thank you, one and all.